Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Gretchen Shaw, the Deputy Director of the NCADV, and today's webinar is called Moment of Truth, a Movement Reckoning and Renewal. And it's being presented today by Karen Transgard Scott, Kelly Miller, and Nan Stoops. We're gonna give people just a, a minute to hop on. I can only see. Um, my own screen. So that makes it a little bit, uh, <laughs> I feel slightly naked on this end. <laughs> so give me just one minute, please. Okay, so I'm going to just move through some housekeeping slides here and then uh, um, I'll be participating in a different way. So as most of you all by now are probably very familiar with Zoom, um, there is a chat feature. Please feel free to chat with others. There's a way to manage your audio. If you have a question, please um, enter that into the Q&A box. We will be monitoring that and the presenters will be pausing at different points throughout the webinar just to check in to see if there are any uh, thematic questions that may be coming through or things that people want to hear more about. Also feel free to raise your hand if you have a question as well. We're going to be doing our best to um, tend to everyone we can throughout this webinar. We have a full webinar today. We've reached our registration um, reached our registration maximum. So uh, yeah, people will definitely um, be fully participated here. Sorry, we're having just a few issues. So I am going to make sure, yep, we've got 198 participants. Thank you all. I should note this is my first time directing the Zoom webinar. So I apologize for any technical issues. It's going to take me just a quick minute to get a bit more familiar on um, with all of this. So we are going on Facebook Live as well. And it's preparing to live stream. I feel like there's always, always a minute where, you know, technology is just not our friends. So once we do launch on Facebook Live, we do invite those there who are watching to share um, their comments and comment boxes. We'll be attending to that as well. So before we begin, we'll be sending to all webinar re registrants a recording of the webinar and a copy of the PowerPoint, a link to a downloadable certificate of attendance, and a link to a short survey. Um, Again, for anyone who might be joining us via Facebook Live, please enter the information um, into the chat box or email us at webinars at NCADV for more information. Okay. So also, we're able to offer this webinar for free today, thanks to the generous support of donors and of course, um, you know, we always welcome you to be a member of NCADV. This webinar is a, a wonderful example of what we're able to provide to NCADV membership. So we hope you visit our website. If you're able to donate, please think about doing so. And please also consider becoming a member today. Uh, also in response to uh, the crisis of COVID, we felt pretty overwhelmed with all the, the amount of information that was out there. It was wonderful to see the, re the response from the field. Um, we did create a, web, a page on our website that has various uh, resources related to COVID-19 and domestic violence, so we highly encourage you to visit. So go to ncadv.org forward slash COVID-19 and domestic violence. Also, if you are inclined to do so, we encourage you to tweet along with today's webinar using the hashtag AdvoChat. 
And you can also follow NTADB on Twitter at at NTADB.org. So of course, you all hopefully have heard about it by now that we are holding our 19th National Conference on Domestic Violence, Recognizing Your Power, October 25th through 28th. Um, we have gone for fully virtual, uh, thanks to COVID again, but it's still going to be a wonderful experience. Our presenter lineup is amazing, as well as our keynotes and plenary sessions. So we highly encourage you to attend. You can learn more and sign up at ncadv.org forward slash conference. All right, so we are going to try these quick polls and we're going to see how this goes because, again, first time using it. Are you all able to see the PowerPoint, by the way? I've been trying to share my screen. Nobody can see the PowerPoint first. Why would that work? Why would that work? Okay. Um, well, how about we just move right into these polls? So I'm quite interested to know and where you all are located. Um, can you all see the polls? Thank goodness. <laughs> Let us know if you're in a rural, suburban, or urban area. If you want to do so, please share via the chat box um, your location. Um, we're happy to have, I think, all 50 states represented, but it looks like we've got Illinois, Georgia, New York. Wonderful, wonderful. Minnesota, West Virginia, Illinois, all over. You all are fantastic. We're thrilled to have you, thrilled to have you. Okay. So hopefully you can see that. It looks like most of you are in urban locations followed by rural and then suburban. Okay, next we're curious to know like how you would define your field of work. If you're a domestic violence sexual assault advocate, victim survivor, law enforcement, legal manager and executive of a domestic violence or sexual assault organization or other. Again, please enter the information into the chat box. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yep, not surprised. The majority of you are identifying as DVSA advocates, victim rights attorneys. That's how someone posts there. Yeah, I'm picking just one. Sorry, I thought I set it up to do multiple, but apparently technology is not on our side already. Housing specialists, wonderful. Okay, so we'll share results. Yep, mostly advocates, victims, survivors, some from law enforcement, government, legal, managers, executives, and then uh, various and sundry others. Great. All right, so we're gonna close that out. Um, I have to catch up on my email. Let's see, so polls. So as we move into the webinar, we are thrilled to have three amazing women who have been more than generous with their time and their information and their uh, thoughts about how we can go about changing the world. And quite frankly, I'm happy to know all three of you and have you all as the leaders of this movement. So I'm gonna introduce each and then we will turn the presentation over to them. Um, Kelly Miller is currently the executive director of the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence and is an alumni cohort member of Move to End Violence. She's a 10-year ten ten initiative of the NOVA Foundation. After 30 years in anti-violence work as an attorney, prosecutor, and activist, she has been on a transformational journey toward our collective liberation and an understanding that liberation has to begin with ourselves. She deeply believes that in order to move towards a world that is independent, resilient, and regenerative, we have to live into that vision ourselves. We cannot become what we cannot imagine. Karen Chonsgard Scott uh, is working toward a world in which all people thrive. Currently, she is focused on building, building solidarity with others who live to end across social spectrums with a focus on gender-based violence. Ms. Transgard Scott has worked in the field to end gender-based violence since 1995, first as an organization in Ohio, Tri-County Help Center, and since 2007 at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, where she is the executive director. 
In 2020, Ms. Chong Scott joined the Master's in Restorative Justice program at the Vermont Law School, where she teaches a course focused on domestic and sexual responses. She's been privileged to have worked with organizations and coalitions in the movement to end gender-based violence throughout the United States in, in Europe. Um, thank you very much. Also, we have Nan Stoops, who is a strategic advisor at the Washington State Coalition on Domestic Violence. She's worked for the anti, in the anti-violence movement as an advocate trainer, um, an organizer for more than 40 years. Currently, she's the strategic advisor of the Washington State Coalition, where she served as the executive director for 17 years. Before coming to the Wisconsin, or I'm sorry, the Washington State Coalition, she was the associate director of the Faith Trust Institute, a national organization that mobilizes religious leaders and communities to address sexual and domestic violence. Um, Ms. Stoops was selected into the first cohort of the Move to End Domestic Violence, a 10-year initiative that brings together visionary leaders from across the country to strengthen our collective effort to end violence against women and girls. She's also received the Seattle Girls School Grace Hopper Award, recognizing professional Northwest women who create pathways and encourage women and girls to become leaders in these communities. So we're thrilled to have you all today. To the audience, please also know we intended to have this session closed caption, but we're not able to secure that. So please know that we will be recording this. We'll be having that recording transcribed and we'll be making that publicly available. So now I will turn the, uh, the platform over to these wonderful women and let you all take it from here. Thank you so much, Gretchen. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Kelly. We welcome all of you, Karen, Nan, and myself, into this conversation today about the moment of truth, a moment of reckoning and renewal. We welcome all of you from across this country who are committed to this moment of reckoning, who are willing to explore how we can individually and collectively end the ways that we fueled white supremacy and police violence against Black, Indigenous, and folks of color how we've done this work through the anti-violence movement and how we can do it very, very differently. We welcome all of you who are ready to do the essential inner work and in reflecting how we have failed black, indigenous and folks of color, survivors, leaders and movements and how we are now committed to engage in collective action. We welcome the black, indigenous and people of color, survivors, advocates and all who have joined today to listen. We welcome all of who you are and acknowledge the profound grief, pain, and anger this week with the shooting of Jacob Blake and every other moment and every other day and every other week as a result of the white supremacy and violence suffered by black, indigenous, and folks of color. We want to thank the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence led by Ruth Glenn and Gretchen Shaw today for inviting us into this and organizing this conversation. We embrace all the quirkiness of technology. And so we're gonna tell you a little bit about how we're gonna structure our conversation today. Um, so Nan, Karen, and myself are gonna have this like a kitchen table conversation. We're gonna provide some context for the moment of truth statement. We're gonna talk about the substance of the statement. And then we're gonna invite folks in the chat to ask questions at that moment. We're gonna encourage folks not to get into the habit of engaging in separate conversations on chat. What I will say for white people generally that we have a habit of distraction or deflecting from really hard conversations. So we're gonna really encourage you to stay with us today with this conversation, uh, but we are gonna give you opportunities to ask questions and we'll do our best along with Gretchen's assistance um, to answer as many as that we can. After we set the context and the substance of the moment of truth statement, we're gonna talk about the reactions. The reactions both within, within our own communities and our own states and across the country. And then I think um, we'll also take a break then to ask any and answer any questions that you might have. And then the probably the most essential part, we're gonna talk about this moment of truth statement in the context of the political environment today. And most importantly, what can we do now? What can we do now? So before we jump into the context, Karen, Nan, do you have any brief things you'd like to share, friends? 
I, I would just add to um, your intro, Kelly, that um, I know, I, I think I speak for the three of us when I say that it would, it would be so great if we could be having this conversation in person um, where we could, you know, sit together um, and see each other and look each other in the eyes and laugh together and, um, and weep, you know, together um, if needed, but that the Zoom uh, platform just doesn't allow for the same kind of, um, you know, uh, relational um, relationship that is really the, I think, the centerpiece of this movement. And so I regret that we can't do this in person. I hope for a day when we can. Um, and just know that uh, to the very best of our ability, um, we are with you wherever you are. And, um, and we know that we are all together uh, as best as we can be in this space. The only thing I would add is uh, just thank you so much, uh, Nan and Kelly, both of you for your introduction. Uh, I, I just want to thank everybody who's on this call and watching it on Facebook Live for the curiosity that brought you to, to this conversation. Thanks, everybody. So let's just kind of like dive into the context and to the substance. Um, I can go ahead and start. I would say like, I mean, much like everyone else in the country, the uh, the brutal murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis was, um, it was not the first, it's not the first, it's in a long history of black people being brutally killed by police, um, state violence. But it was a, a reckoning, it was a tipping point um, that in conjunction with like Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmaud Aubrey, uh, just all the different like horrific murders that we've borne witness to, um, and, you know, I don't think we'll ever know, was it COVID that also kind of attributed, were people paying more attention? You know, I, I think the complexity around the context is that what white people have become awoken to, or, you know, that we've been hearing this from Black, Indigenous, and folks of color for decades, decades and hundreds of years, right? So none of this is new, um, but it was a reckoning moment for us. And, and so I think um, what I would say that happened is that many of us who'd been doing a lot of this deep work over the last five or six years and really reflecting, I'm talking about many of us being white women who were leading state coalitions um, in particular, were really reflecting on the choices that we've made over the many decades in terms of aligning directly with criminal justice, which I think is one of the most patriarchal white supremacist organizations. All of our institutions are right across the country, but that's who we aligned with decades ago um, as being a primary solution. And so it, it's not surprising that the many of us that have been really reflecting and doing work to really undo um, this system of harm in the anti-violence field began to come together online, of course, um, and in response to many of the extraordinary black women leaders who've been doing this work for you know, decades and decades, like Beth Ritchie and Monica Dennis and Rachel Abraham, and then all the extraordinary folks doing the restorative and transformative justice work, like Miriam Kaba and Mimi Kim and Mia Mingus. And, and so a small group of us came together and said, now's the time to like, like be bold and, and be visible and do something. And uh, so the statement began to take shape, which took a couple of weeks to come together. Nan or Karen, you want to add in to the, how the context it just started, maybe like pretty soon after the uh, murder of George Floyd? Okay, so um, a, a few things that I want to, to say about this, and we, we had a couple of slides that I know um, Gretchen is trying frantically to get up on the screen, and Gretchen, it's okay. Don't worry about it, just stop trying. Um, uh, because we'll just describe them, and I'm actually, I'm drawing them. So, um, so no worries there. Um, but the first, the first uh, slide that we were going to show you is actually a cartoon. And it's a cartoon that has a, a, a caterpillar and a butterfly sitting together at, uh, I'm going to say it's like a little table in a cafe in Paris. And um, they're they each have a glass of wine and they're sitting there and the caterpillar says to the butterfly, 
you've changed. And the butterfly says, we're supposed to. Now, so this thing about um, metamorphosis and transformation and change within our own movement um, has been a matter of discussion among many of us for many years. So for years preceding this statement. But um, because we're at a point in this movement where we are, you know, 40, 50 years old as a social justice movement, um, there are many of us who have worked <laughs> ooh, long enough that we have the long view, right? We have the long view of the movement. And we've learned a lot of things about our work and about ourselves, about the things that work well, about the things that don't work as well, about, about the people that we're bringing along and the people that we're leaving behind. And so um, the, this, this, uh, this kind of thing about um, like a, a, deep, a deep, we're in this moment and we were prior to the statement, we were prior to the murder of George Floyd. As a movement, we were in this period, we have been in this period of deep questioning, right? Really questioning kind of what, what is our purpose and what is this work that we do and who are we? So there are many state coalitions, many programs around the country, many, many advocates and leaders who have been, you know, kind of tossing this around um, uh, for a while now. And I think that coupled with actually tripled, right, with um, the fact that we're in a period of tremendous uh, political and social unrest um, and, and a pandemic that has us isolated and, um, and uh, anxious, you know, um, it's kind of this perfect storm for uh, really figuring out right? How are we going to emerge from this? Who are we going to be? Uh, and what should we be doing? Um, and then, as Kelly was saying, right, we have this uh, string of, um, of murders of, uh, of Black folks. And, um, and so I think, I, I'm saying all of this just to, just to try to situate the statement in a longer uh, period of questioning that many, many, many of us around the country um, had already been doing, right? And changes that we have already embarked upon in our work um, and seeing that we now actually need to um, give sharp focus and um, add some speed and intensity um, to the way in which we go about change. Do you want me to add something here? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, Nan, thank you so much for that um, explanation. I always learn from you, even though you know we talk what seems like daily. Um, I, I really appreciate it. You know, I think that uh, when I think about this, Nan talks about the arc of change. One of the things that has kept me in this movement for such a long time was this idea of change and this investment in, in the reality that individuals and communities and organizations and systems can change. That's been the, the foundation of our work for a really long time. And there's a big difference between change and transformation. And um, for me, it's felt, for a long time, it's felt like our movement is in a place where what's called for is transformation. We are good at change. We're good at um, creating changes, but we have less, less uh, kind of muscle around this idea of of transformation and transformation is a little is is a little bit more um, it's a little scarier than um, than change. But it is as Nan said, it feels like this is the moment um, and has been the moment for a while for us to be really stepping into um, a transformation of our movement. I think one of the things I want to mention and I'm seeing in the chat just to be sure that folks um, understand that the moment of truth statement. Uh, came out in June of this year, soon after the killing of George Floyd. And it was written with the idea that it was 
predominantly from white state coalition leaders who are, are dominant across the country in terms of leadership. Um, that's like a, a significant challenge and issue that we need to continue to directly confront. And it was written to our, ourselves basically as a, as a point of accountability that we really have failed to listen to, to advocate for, to follow um, black, indigenous, and folks of color survivors, leaders in the movement. Um, when we think about like the context, one of the things I would name that um, Nan has been doing a really great job in terms of pulling state coalitions together. And all of this is, frankly, a lot of this is rooted in the three of us having an experience and moved in violence and really understanding that the anti-violence field, the mainstream across the country was really established to serve, um, as Beth Ritchie has said in her extraordinary book, Arrested Justice, white, temporarily poor, able-bodied, heteronormative, heterosexual women. Um, and we, we, that's a reckoning, that's a reckoning. And, and so when we think about the context, I think the other one I would wanna lift up in 2015, I think, does that sound right? The National Domestic Violence Hotline also did a study that showed that um, so many survivors that access police didn't experience the safety and justice that, that I think um, that it was intended or imagined you know, decades ago. And we have to hold that complexity at the same time that black women leaders in particular have been saying this to the field for like decades and decades. I mean, and it's just something that white women like myself weren't listening. And so when I think about the context of the letter, I think it's also important to lift up um, the work of the black women who've been doing this for so long. And I really encourage everyone on this to order Arrested Justice. And the one chapter that was so informative for me in terms of context is how we won the mainstream and lost the movement. And that is like such a chapter two. Thanks, thanks, Karen. Um, that was such a transformative chapter for me. Do you want to talk about how the statement was written? Sure. Yeah. So um, a couple of things happened simultaneously. Uh, we heard from a, a peer colleague of ours that she had um, been to, uh, she, she had attended a, a, a workshop or a conference, and I, I, I just can't, I can't remember the name of it. It was a um, webinar with Angela webinar. Davis. Okay, well, that, that explains say anything yeah. more, right? <laughs> um, and, she, and she just was like, we have got to do something. At the same time, I got an email from my dear friend, Beth Ritchie, that, uh, who Kelly was just talking about, um, Beth's book. And she said, you know, Nan, this is, this is it. This is the time. I'm ready. I'm ready for, um, I'm ready to, for the mainstream to, to really do something. And um, so what are you going to do about that? And, um, you know, because I've worked with Beth for, for decades, really, and um, we've been friends for so long and I have seen uh, the ways in which the movement did not heed um, the 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 requests, the pleading, you know, and the sistership that she has offered to us for so so many years, and uh, with tremendous dignity and graciousness, that we we did not listen. Um, I just you know I was really I really just felt like I can't. I can't, I can't be a part of that anymore. I cannot be a part of ignoring her anymore. Um, she has given too much and women uh, like her, who I could name, you know, they are a part of our shared history in this movement, women of color, right, that I could name, many of whom are no longer with us, you know, um, that I feel a debt to them. So I was um, determined, you know, to not just say something, but to do something. So, um, so, you know, I said, hey, to Kelly and Karen and a few others, you know, what are we going to do? And so we, we very quickly, actually the white women, very quickly drafted a statement. And then uh, a few uh, women of color, um, primarily black women, reviewed it 
and um, and we made substantive uh, edits, which were uh, graciously received, and um, and there was the statement. And you know, I want to say that um, I thought that we would have just a few coalitions sign on, and um, and I kind of had a sense of who they would be. You know, Idaho and Vermont and Washington and maybe a couple of others. Um, and I was astonished by how many coalitions signed on. And you all have the statement and you can see the list. Um, we, we're, we have a, a margin of error among the three of us of plus or minus two. But I think it was, uh, I think it was 48 state coalitions, sexual, sexual assault and domestic violence coalitions signed on, representing 35 states. And, um, you know, I was uh, just uh, really very moved, um, not only, not just by the numbers, really, but by the, um, by the emails that we received um, about the conversations that people were having that led to them either signing or not signing. So, right, the thing that's important here is not whether or not a state coalition signed on or whether or not your state coalition signed on. Um, it's the conversations that people had and the thoughtfulness and the curiosity and the very deep, I think, um, soul searching that people did um, as they considered, you know, what was in this statement. So I am uh, humbled and grateful right, to all of the coalitions, those that signed and those that didn't, because I know that everyone took this extremely seriously. Um, you know, the other thing is that, that I think we want to say is that the statement is just a statement. And the intent of the statement has always been for it to spark conversation and for it to spark um, uh, an, an exploration into the possibility of change for us. So a statement is only as good as the actions that follow it, you know. And so we, we do want to, I think, uh, towards the end of our time today, talk a little bit about what might follow. But it, it's only a launch pad, right? It's just, otherwise it is just a statement. And so the big question now is really, what are we going to do? You know, now, okay, great, we have this statement. Uh, what are we going to do with it? And um, I, I want to say also just kind of about the distribution. Okay. The statement uh, was in a way, it was an internal movement document, right? We sent it to state coalitions. We asked them to sign on if they, if they wanted to, many did. And then uh, once, once it was, uh, we had a cutoff date, uh, which was in July. And uh, once that uh, happened, we sent it to um, a number of national uh, organizations. Um, so you'll recognize NCADV, National Network to End Domestic Violence, Battered Women's Justice Project, Domestic Violence Resource Network. These are all like national organizations that work with and on behalf of you um, and the survivors that you all work with. So, and it was really just like kind of an FYI, you know, like, um, we want you to know that many coalitions signed on to this and that um, it will uh, hopefully inform the programming work that coalitions do, the kinds of policy that we advocate for, the kinds of relationships in our communities that we prioritize, um, the kinds of messages that we're using uh, with the general public as we um, uh, continue you know, to try to shape public opinion about sexual violence and domestic violence. So, um, you know, so that, and that was the extent of the distribution. Now we know that it has gotten out further than that. And that, you know, that's fine. Like we don't have, we don't have control over where uh, information goes and we're certainly not um, gatekeepers of it, right? But it was literally really the primary audience was, and was, the, was the movement. Right, so that we as a, as a movement could try to figure out what's our direction and what's our work gonna be for the next, for the next many, many years to come. So that, I just wanted to kind of add a little bit of that around the, 
uh, like the development of the statement and um, and what happened to it. So I don't know, Karen, Kelly, if you want to say more before we kind of get into the substance. Karen, any anything before we get into substance? I just want to reiterate the reaction of folks um, on the original distribution list, the reaction of coalitions, and 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 underscore what Nan said about the, the, the poignancy of the responses that we got. So some, some states signed on right away, uh, but many states went through a kind of arduous, an arduous process to decide whether or not to sign on to the, to the statement. And many states decided to sign on even though they knew that there would be backlash in their states and many state leadership, lead coalition leaders decided not to sign on because of the risk of backlash. And both of those realities are absolutely valid. You know, there's not, um, the, the beauty of it is that there was no, there was no pressure for, for anybody to sign on. There's no um, expectation for signing on. And as Nan uh, said, the, the conversations were really beautiful. And many of the comments that I heard from folks, from white leaders, in coalitions um, were along the lines of, I felt like this for a long time, this gives me the words that I've been thinking for a really long time. And so I, you know, I felt there was great alignment across, um, across the country. I think the only thing I would add is that some state coalitions did their own statement as well, um, even if they didn't do this statement. And I think the other one lesson learned I would lift up is that I think we could have been more explicit at the front end, that this was really about um, predominantly white women coalition directors um, and taking accountability for all. Because I think the complexity, I don't know if Nan or Karen you wanna share, for black coalition directors, like what? You know, I mean, this letter was really about accountability for white supremacy from white women leaders. Should we dive into yeah, I think yeah. I think we all agree that there are some things that we we would have done differently um, in terms of communicating uh, early, very early on, with um, with black leaders in our movement, and um, you know, not not necessarily just coalition leaders, but but yeah. black leaders in our movement. Um, I think also communicating earlier with Native American and Indigenous leaders, knowing that. Um, uh, that you know, um, th thinking about liberation and about violence um, is also, and you know, and healing is uh, is um, unique um, in their in those communities. And then um, uh, also seeing this really as being based on the um, continent in the continental states. Um, because also for territory, U.S. territory folks, um, uh, I think just the experience of, um, of Black, Lives, Black Lives Matter and their connection to it um, is also quite different. Um, I know that I've said to uh, a few Native American uh, sisters that um, I wish that as a field, right, and as a movement, we had had this readiness um, uh, for Standing Rock, right? And that when something like Standing Rock happens again, we will, we will be, we will be here for that. Um, and, and we're ready for that. So uh, this is, um, I, I think this is maybe one statement of many, you know, that, um, that is a movement we uh, would be considering. Sure, we'll to, yeah, it's, let's, let's show your fancy slide. Okay, here's the, the substance. <laughs> um, so we want to talk a little bit about the substance of the statement, and then, and then we're going to take a, a pause and take a look at your questions um, and, address, and address those as best we can, um, and then come back around to some conversation about the kind of the reactions and the, the, the current climate and, um, and the what next. Okay, so here, ready for the slide? Here we go, let's see. Okay, this, okay. That's a Venn diagram, obviously. And um, this, is a, a, this is a Venn diagram that is used uh, 
quite a bit by the Movement Strategy Center and um, other folks who are really trying to figure out, like, uh, you know, kind of how, how, how to break down um, our, uh, our thinking about um, uh, change and transformation into manageable uh, components. And so what you can see are three circles. Uh, one is what do we want? The other is what do we believe? And the third is how do we get what we want? And another way to think of these are um, to say that what do we want is about vision, what do we believe is about ideology, and how do we get what we want is about strategy. And you can see I put that little uh, double arrow thing there. And the reason why I did that is because I think that as a movement, we tend to spend most of our time in the two circles uh, called uh, uh, around ideology and strategy. Um, and that they are interconnected, right? That our strategy is connected to what we believe and then um, what we believe drives our strategy. Um, you can see the sweet spot there is shaded in and that's where all three circles come together. So for the purposes of talking about the statement, I want to um, do something that we don't very often do, remembering, right, that we tend to vacillate between uh, what we believe and how we get what we want. Um, I want to start with, um, uh, how, yeah, how do we get what we want? I want to start with what we want, okay? Because all three uh, components of that circle are represented in the statement. Now, I, I don't think we did that by intent. I had to actually read the statement again and say, okay, are they all there? But they are. So, I, and I want to lead with vision, okay? And the vision is at the top of page two, where it says, a better world is within reach. It is being remembered and imagined in BIPOC communities around the world, and it is calling us to be a part of it. In this world, all human beings have inherent value, even when they cause harm. People have what they need, adequate and nutritious food, housing, quality education and healthcare, meaningful work and time with family and friends, and all sentient beings are connected, including Mother Earth. That's the vision. That's what we want. Okay. Um, in terms of the, what we believe, I think there are a few aspects of this, and Karen and Kelly, I wanna invite you uh, to chime in here too. But I think first and foremost, first and foremost, as Kelly was saying, we believe that, um, that our movement has to, uh, has to deal with some of the um, ways in which we have participated in the harm that uh, the black, that black people and communities of color and indigenous communities um, experience, that we have to um, understand uh, that our complicity and partnership has um, has actually resulted um, in harm. So that was one of the I think one of the beliefs that's embedded um, in in the statement. Um, the, another belief is that, um, is that it's time to really sh make a shift from uh, individual solutions for domestic violence and sexual violence. And by individual solutions, meaning individual safety and individual accountability. And the institutions that are charged with providing those. So we, in some ways, are an institution that has taken on the responsibility of providing safety. And we have relied on the criminal legal system as an institution to hold individuals accountable. And so what we want to do, what we believe is that it's time to move safety and accountability into the realm of communities, right? Where communities participate in accountability and communities participate in safety. 
The other thing that's in here is really about a building up and a strengthening of communities um, so that they are able to resist uh, and reduce violence. And so this is also about a shift from a focus on intervention to a focus on prevention. So these are not new concepts and new beliefs for us as a movement. We, as we were saying, we have already been, right, exploring the need to make these kinds of shifts. It's presented in the statement through the lens of Black Lives Matter and some of the calls to action that, uh, that Black leaders and, um, and organizations um, have, uh, have put forward. But at their core, what's called for here are shifts that, that we, uh, many of us already have believed our movement needs to make in terms of getting uh, reconnected in community and focusing on the capacity and the ability of communities to, to, to deal with things like safety and accountability, um, and a belief that we need to move upstream and really um, make it possible, right, to have a world in which sexual violence and domestic violence are no longer inevitable, particularly for women and girls of color, black women, black girls, and black trans folks. So, um, so you know, um, okay, so that's what we believe. And then uh, what we want is, um, or how do we get what we want in terms of the strategy is in those uh, one, two, three, four, five bullets, that uh, bullet points that were drawn from um, a couple, a few different sources, primarily um, aid to abolition and, um, and uh, insight. Um, and again, if, if we, if you really, uh, if we, when we really look at those five bullets, they, um, they are strategies to achieve the thing, the kinds of things that I just described around um, strengthening communities um, and, and so forth. Um, we wanted to use the exact language of the source, okay? And so people will draw their own conclusions and make their own interpretations about what we're calling for um, here. And we might, I think we'll get into some of that when we're talking about the, the reactions in the current environment. Um, but we very intentionally drew strategies that uh, we felt were uh, quite, you know, logically um, and uh, in terms of purpose connected with the work that we do in this movement. So, I mean, in terms of the Venn diagram, that, that I think is the, is the substance of the statement. Um, we, want, we wanted very much for it to be hopeful. You know, we wanted for it to be serious. Um, and we wanted it to be something that anyone who read it would have a relationship with it, right? And so the question for all of us has been, what will our relationship with it be? Nan, I've got a couple. Um, I think that was super helpful and great. I think one of the things I would add to it I mean, I think this, what this statement does is it holds the long arc, as you just so beautifully described, to what we hope, hope for. And I, um, as somebody who identifies as white, it also names the complexities of what's happening right now in real time and why it's so important that we made explicitly the statement, Black Lives Matter, why we also explicitly named about the significant investment in criminal justice systems at a time when we know that Black, Indigenous, and folks of color are over-criminalized, over-incarcerated, um, that when we look at the anti-violence field, how so much of the funds are invested in criminal justice systems response. And look, I don't say this lightly. I, I mean, I was a prosecutor for a number of years. 
um, a civil attorney and now with the state coalition. And, and it's like, how do we hold the multiple truths where there are some survivors that access criminal justice system that experience the, the safety, the agency, um, and some semblance of justice. And at the same time, we know that many don't access it for fear of being harmed, whether they're black, indigenous, whether they're undocumented, folks of color. Um, and then the other reality is that folks access, survivors access this and are actually re-traumatized. Um, so we have to be able to hold all of those multiple truths, which I think the letter actually also speaks to the belief around that. Thank you, Kelly. It's so important. I, the, the one thing I would add is that this is not an indictment necessarily of, uh, of the individuals that all of us know and work with who work in those systems. We, the analysis is, moves beyond the individual. It, moves, it is about uh, structural um, systems that are um, harming people. And certainly we can po point out individuals within any system that um, might be considered bad actors, but that's really not that useful at this moment. What's really useful for us to understand is that we can make a choice about um, how we interact with, with these systems, including our own system. And we can make a choice about um, our participation uh, and, 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 base, and we can make a choice about whose voices we're listening to. So, you know, what this letter is really asking us to do is to consider that there are some voices that we have ignored. And, and it's, it, it is vitally important that we stop doing that. And the, um, the impetus for the letter is to say, um, let's really listen to the voices of the, the people that are marginalized, not just in our society, but also inside of our own movement. Thanks, Karen. Should we invite all of our friends on the Zoom to see if there's any questions before we dive into response and reaction? I just, I've been tracking a couple questions, so I just want to um, raise these up because they're further back in the, um, in the chat mechanism. There's a question about how do um, organizations like practically divest um, of resources and power, and then related to that is um, how do how do we bring, come to bring the movement together to commit to resource equity, including reallocating resources? And then a final question, which is not related to that, it has to do, uh, are we talking, are we advocating for um, changing mandatory repressed policies? Mm -hmm. All good, juicy questions. Anybody want to dive into any of them? Okay, here's one that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I, I guess, try to respond to the one about, about resources. Um, so I, I, really, I really think that um, central to any uh, ac activity, right? So whether it's like shifting resources or um, I'm hoping the two of you will talk about the policy stuff a little bit. I mean, I, I could, but I think you should. Um, is, I mean, that is that we, we work the relationships that we have and that if there are certain relations, certain strategic or important relationships that are missing, that we first prioritize building those relationships because we ought not be the ones making the decisions in a vacuum about how resources will move from whom, to whom, what the mechanisms are, who will it benefit, I mean, all of that. Because again, we have, as Kelly was saying, we have a lot of um, muscle that we've built up over the years about how those kinds of, of uh, transactions, if you will, will happen. And I think it's really important that as we're um, contemplating these kinds of changes, that we figure out what are the relationships that are really gonna give the changes that we make stickiness, right? So uh, absolutely, we should be thinking if you're a well-resourced organization, where should some of your resource go, right? I'm not trying to say at all, don't do it or be careful or anything like that, but it's like, 
who do you, who do you want to be in relationship with to make sure that that change is done with integrity and that it meets the purpose that you set out to meet uh, that you set out with, with. In, Nan actually I'm gonna um, say I think there is a place where you could be sending resources right now if you have black leaders in your community start resourcing them use whatever funds you're unrestricted whatever you have available and making sure that they have whatever they need to continue this really essential work. So, I mean, I think that is one thing for mainstream organizations that, I mean, I think that's one of our roles, especially if, if I think about organizations that are white led, um, predominantly white. I mean, these are, these are the ways that we can actually contribute to this, this reckoning, this moment in time right now. Yeah, I think that's good, Kelly. The only caution I would have about that is that we don't take a kind of, oh, Black Lives Matter is the, is the issue du jour. Right. Right. No, and then we good. disappear, yeah. which is why I think the relationship, right, in which we have other ways besides money to demonstrate a commitment, right, to like an ongoing resourcing, an ongoing we will show mm -hmm. up, we will show up um, is important. Yeah, I hear you. I also think there's something about the the this the question of divestment of power and resources that has to do with the very structure of our own organizations in which power is concentrated and resources are concentrated in the um, in the laps of few inside organizations and you know we know uh, that Audre Lord long ago said you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools and yet our organizations really reflect a dominant cultural patriarchal model and um, and so the, the, the question about, I mean, this is a, this is a national conversation, but, but most of us don't have national footprints. So, so, so for me anyway, the, the, the question I ask myself all the time is within this place that I can have an impact, what are the ways that I can di 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 diffuse my own power and push power out within communities, within organizations where I have um, where I actually have some some ability to do that. And I think that if we get enough of us doing that, then there will be this transformation within the within the movement because there'll be a critical mass. Kelly, you um, want to talk about mandatory arrest? You know, Idaho is not a mandatory arrest um, state. So I know like a, a little, I don't know if Vermont is either, but I mean, from the things I've read, and there's probably people on this call that know far more than I do around this. I mean, it's just, I mean, whenever we're criminalizing behavior in a way without being able to take into the complexity of the situation, without being able to shift in the way that Nan talked about it, really moving to what community accountability looks like. I mean, I think that there's going to be issues. So I think it's definitely like a, uh, mandatory arrest is, is something that we need to really be uh, moving away from. I don't know if either one of you have more than that. That's not a very complex analysis. I'm well, say. This, I guess, I don't know. I do have a thought about mandatory arrest. Um, because I know that it's a really concrete uh, thing that we could all say, oh, well, we should, we should or we shouldn't or we should be talking about this, you know, about repealing mandatory arrest. And, uh, uh, you know, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm Okay, I'm not a policy person, I'm not a lawyer, but my very rudimentary un understanding would be that even if we were to repeal mandatory arrest, um, people could still be arrested, right? So it still is very much sure. dis discretionary. And so I think the question for us is how much energy do we want to spend internally as a movement trying to figure out, because I think this is gonna be a very fraught, conversation for us, as were the conversations that resulted in mandatory arrest. Um, I actually think this would be more fraught because, so it's a question of, do we want to invest a lot of our own energy and resource in going to a place that's so fraught? Or do we want to say, you know what, it, it, mandatory arrest, uh, for all of its, I mean, it, for some people it works, for many it doesn't. And we're actually gonna spend our energy on building better supports for people 
who are harmed, for people who cause harm, and for people for whom the vulnerability to being or causing harm is high. Right? It's really about where do we take our finite resources and energy? Where do we want to spend that? And I, I, am, I guess I will say I'm actually a proponent of spending it on, on what we want, what we want for people, not on what we're trying to dismantle, um, you know, which is something that we built, which makes it even harder to dismantle. I'm just taking a moment to glance at the um, at some of the questions. Um, I, I, I just want to say, you know, this thing about mandatory arrest, we're not a mandatory arrest state in Vermont either. And I look to the work uh, that happens with our colleagues in the sexual violence world. Mandatory arrest rem reminds me of those, those solutions, those solutions like residency restrictions and um, uh, um, uh, mandatory sentencing for sex offenders and how the research actually tells us that those are, it's, those are false solutions. And so anytime we're thinking about something like a, a mandatory arrest policy, I think we have to really take an examination of what the, what the research tells us and what the field tells us and what survivors tell us. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and know that what might seem like the perfect answer on the surface is, is often not a great answer for the vast majority of folks. Um, I want to just note that there's a question about gaslighting, about statements that are, um, you know, everybody's making a statement right now, and sometimes it can feel like gaslighting. Uh, and then there's also a question about whether the statement, the gaslighting that's inherent in these statements, you know, this, we will do this, we will do that, and then nothing happens, um, or it creates, creates just a false impression. Uh, is that related to, um, is that related to violence, and I think that the, the person who's asking the question was also really thinking about how domestic violence is um, woven into some of the statements that are being made uh, on broader issues uh, around policing and, and um, divestment from policing. I can say that if nothing happens as a result of the statement, we should be called gaslighters. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think about all the people we're accountable to, like, you know, many of the extraordinary black leaders in this country who've uh, been so generous in terms of giving us their thoughts, their wisdom, their learnings. And I mean, that's who I feel accountable to in terms of making sure that we continue to kind of make the shifts and, and grow the kind of communities we want. Um, I don't know, Nan, what are your thoughts around that? Well, I, I, guess, I guess my thought is that it's really, really, really important to, to stay clear on who we are. Now, I, I think I mean that as like who each one of us is. Because to try to uh, establish um, a, a cohesive, unified, same identity collectively mm -hmm. um, also would be a very yeah. challenging exercise. But it is really important. Like this is a time like no other for each one of us individually to have a sense of who we are, mm -hmm. you know, what we stand for, what we want, who we are with, um, and I'm not even gonna say who we're against, it's who we're with, because I actually, I think, I think, like when I think of myself, I, I think I'm with more people than I most days believe that I am. You know, um, I, I, I kinda have to, I kinda have to go with that, right, because the, Less I believe that, the more likely I am to be, what's the past tense, gaslit? You know, um, 
we're, I mean, you know, we wanted to talk about this later, but I just think this is such a hard time right now in this country. It is a really hard time. And gaslighting is going to be a primary strategy. And I don't want to participate in it as a recipient or as the doer. I really don't. I want to be solid in what I believe, what the world that I want, and how I think we can get there. I could be wrong, you know. I could be wrong on some of the strategy stuff. That's okay. But I don't want to be wrong, you know. I don't think I'm wrong about the world that I want and, like, some of the things that I believe. Um, and I won't be swayed. You know, I won't be swayed from those. I can be swayed on strategy. People tell me all the time, man, that's not the right way to do it. Okay. But, um, but I don't have that many people say, oh, you're wrong in what you want. Because like, what's wrong with wanting, you know, a place where every single one of us has inherent value, right? Where violence isn't inevitable, right? Where people have what they need have a good life that like who could say that that's wrong so i mean people are saying that it's wrong but um i don't think so so uh i don't know i guess that's what i have to say about that i was going to do a time check we've got about 25 minutes should we do those poll questions yes huh. okay let's see Poll one all right can you all see it? So I personally agree with the statement. Overwhelmingly. Looks like most do. Some people are not quite sure. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. So we've got 87% who do agree with this statement, 1% who do not, and then another 12% that don't know. Okay. Do you want me to move on to the next two? Okay. All right. My organization agrees with the statement. Okay. All right, it looks like got about, uh, I'm sorry, 55% that, that says yes, their organization agrees with the statement, another 5% that feel they do not, and then another 40 that are not sure. Okay. All right. My personal opinion about the statement aligns with my organization's opinion. Okay. All right, it looks like we've got the voting slowing down. So it looks like 51% share that yes, the organization aligns with the, uh, or sorry, their personal opinion about the same and aligns with their organization's opinion. 14% say no, 35% say they are not sure. Okay. Here you go. Great. Okay. Any reflections on the poll, or should we jump into reactions and a little bit about impact and political context? Well, I think just um, I'll just say this about the the, the poll results. Um, uh, you know, I just noted that eighty seven percent of you individually indicated agreement with the statement, and then there's more ambiguity around organiz organizations and a lot of not knowing where your organizations are. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we expected 
that that would be the case. And I think it's just to say, right, that in this really kind of fraught time, that can uh, that can be existentially challenging, right? To have strong beliefs one way or the other, right? Um, uh, because we are binary thinkers, right? We either agree or we disagree. And because we're in a time where um, we're strongly encouraged to have strong opinions, right? Um, it can be then challenging not to know, like, does my organization agree with me or not? And then will my organization have my back if I'm doing this, that, or the other thing? It just can be hard um, to, to wonder, can I be my full self in my workplace? And um, is my workplace exercising its potential for full selfhood, given its stated purpose and mission? And so some of you have said in the chat that, you know, you want to bring it back to your organization. And I think that's great, right? And I would say just do it conversationally, right? Like, this is a statement that's kind of out there. People are wondering what it means for our work. What do we think about it? Where do we agree? Where do, where do we see there are challenges, um, right? But to have a conversation and kind of do a, a pulse check. Where do you two want to go now? I'm just kind of like realizing what time we have left. Do we want I to think we should go into about? reactions. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. And, and kind of what next? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want me to dive in on this first? Sure. Um, so Idaho um, is a large rural state in the northwest of the country. I mean, we're, I mean, we don't want to single story the, the state that we're intolerant and conservative. Um, I live here. And I hope I'm not either one of those. Um, what I would say in our state is that uh, early after uh, George Floyd had been murdered, uh, we gathered like 49 of our nonprofits that came together uh, with a statement similar to the statement, a little bit different, um, and that we published in 15 newspapers. We didn't hear a lot of backlash in that particular statement. Just about a week or two later, we sent out the moment of truth to our domestic and sexual violence community tribal member programs uh, with the intention of having a conversation about the statement because we thought it was important um, to have that conversation about the statement with our program members. Um, for the Idaho Coalition, this statement aligned with everything that we have been trying to do and more importantly be over the last five years, um, directly attributed to the move to end violence experience. We made a fairly significant coalition shift back in 2015, that we would center our work on communities that are most impacted by marginalization, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Idaho folks of color, LGBTQ communities, and more. Um, we have had our member programs, 23 member programs in the state, on the same journey with us in, in different levels of engagement. Um, much like every state, there is a diversity of thought across our program members. Some uh, understood and supported the coalition having signed off on the statement. Uh, many were curious and just wanted to know more and understand, you know, understand what the intention of the statement was and what did it mean? What did it mean specifically for our work? And then we had some programs that were struggling um, and in direct opposition. And as a result, we've had four uh, of our community domestic violence programs, domestic and sexual violence programs withdraw membership. Um, and they severed membership specifically because of concerns around relationships with local law enforcement in their communities. Um, and so, you know, of course we engaged in many conversations with everyone, um, you know, provided as much input and directionality as we could, but they withdrew both because of the moment of truth, but also frankly because of the direction of the Idaho Coalition. At the same time, we know that this letter, um, the moment of truth statement was circulated to law enforcement. We don't know who, um, chose to circulate it. And like Nan said, it's not something that we're hiding. So at that point, we decided we actually posted it on our website. Um, and so the, the response from law enforcement was pretty um, 
as you might have expected. They, they, many, many, not everyone, took it as a direct attack. And in the end, despite like many conversations with the boards of the various, like for example, the Idaho Sheriff's Association, where we had really robust and I thought really good dialogue, um, both the Idaho Sheriff's Association, the Idaho Chiefs of Police have sent official letters saying that they have withdrawn support uh, of the Idaho Coalition and no longer want to be in any kind of collaborative relationship. At the same time, that doesn't speak to um, other, you know, policing agencies, individual chiefs or sheriffs across the state who are also, you know, see that this is also a moment of self-reflection and are willing to continue to engage in important conversations about bias within the criminal justice system, not just policing, but across the entirety of the system. Um, so it's something that we're, we're going to be able to weather the storm. We're, we're um, in opposition. My hope is that we'll still be in relationship with the programs that withdrew. Um, my hope is that over time that they will continue to see that uh, coming back into membership and, and engaging in these conversations is, is exactly what we need to do. So uh, that was the reaction here in Idaho. Karen, how about you in Vermont? Vermont, uh, sorry, Vermont is a is a small, uh, much more liberal state, and in some, you know, the, the term gaslighting is used here a lot, because there's a lot of conversation about how great and liberal we are, and very often there's not a lot of action that sits behind that. But like you, Kelly, you know, we've been having these conversations, um, centering our, uh, centering our work around. Um, Black and Indigenous and people of color here in Vermont, even though there are very few of them. Our crisis came a couple of years ago uh, around a different issue that involved uh, uh, a conversation about race. And um, we experienced something similar, not to the same extent, extent that you're experiencing at Kelly. But there were calls for, you know, uh, law enforcement leadership saying they wouldn't work with us anymore and calls for, for you know, contact with my board saying I should be fired, all those things. The, um, the reaction to the letter um, at this point has been um, actually pretty positive from our law enforcement community. And I say that, you know, as I knock on all the wood that's surrounding me, because I think that there's, uh, there's I'm sure that there are, are individuals within our community, our law enforcement community leaders who are not happy with this letter. But, but you know, the reality is, is that the, the letter does something, it does exactly, it, it, it's a demonstration of us actually walking the talk. And that's the feedback that I've heard from law enforcement leaders in our state. It, 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 we, we name it. We name where we failed. We named where we've caused harm. We take responsibility for it. And then we have a series of, we name the actions that we're going to take and we make a public commitment to that. And for the law enforcement leaders in Vermont, that's been, that's been a good model. Um, in terms of our membership, uh, you know, we, we have been talking about the intersection of race and um, gender-based violence for quite some time, as, as, you know, as is true in Washington and, and Idaho and across the country. And one of the questions, uh, you know, in the chat is why, you know, this isn't just about race, but actually in this moment for us, this is all about race. This is, you know, we see racism as the root cause. It's the, it's the root of oppression sits with racism in this country. And right at this moment, there is actually, in my mind, no other conversation to have. So, um, so I think that there wasn't the surprise on the part of our membership or uh, other um, stakeholders and, and um, other groups in our state that you're seeing in, in Idaho. But um, that that's for today. And... Um, it could change at any time. And, you know, we learned, and maybe Nan, you'll say something about this. You know, we've also learned that if, I, if either Kelly or I are, you know, we're women of color, uh, especially black women, that things could look even worse for Kelly and look a lot different for me. Which is yeah, yeah. about racism. Yeah. I think it's also important for folks to know that um, here, one of the ways the letter was circulated was also through the Fraternal Order of Police, which did decide in Idaho to circulate it nationally um, to all the Fraternal Order of Police across the country. So, Karen, exactly what you named. I mean, some of the first people that were uh, experiencing opposition were Black coalition directors, right? Um, so there's just, yeah, just a, 
a lot around that that we have to also hold that like, you know, I can take certain risks, but I have to realize that people in the end who are going to be most harmed are going to be black, indigenous and folks of color. Yeah, I think we have to, we have to, especially around this, um, we have to acknowledge that um, structures get used to punish individuals. And so in terms of backlash, right, I think we're seeing a little bit of threat around stru structures being used to punish other structures. So our programs, but particularly certain individuals, um, which certainly falls in line with what we're seeing right around the country in terms of um, kind of uh, this rising up, uh, this rising up of, uh, of white supremacy and, um, and then uh, who pays for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think it's, uh, I just wanna, I guess, say again that um, it is so important to figure out right, each one of us, what we stand for, who we stand with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm seeing some things in the chat here. I, I, I think it's fair to say, I, ju I just want to speak honestly about this. The main, what they're saying, what people are saying is that this statement is calling for the defunding of police. Now, um, I, I want to, uh, I want to acknowledge that this statement is not actually as bold as some people wanted it to be. And one of the ways in which that's true is it does not say defund the police. Now, this is not an argument, right, to get into with people who are like, this says defund the police, but it actually doesn't. It draws heavily from the eight to abolition platform, one of which their eight calls to action is defund the police. We did not include that because we strategically, we knew that it would be uh, uh, such a hot button issue. Um, we did include invest in care, not cops, and remove police from schools. And people are reading in here, defund the police. Now that is about their reactivity to the time, right? The law enforcement right now, um, as an institution, right, is on the defensive. And, um, and it must be very challenging, right, for the individuals who work in that institution, who are aligned with us, it must be very challenging for them, right? Um, so we are not saying in here, <laughs> we are not saying that all cops are bad. We are saying that the institution is fraught with racism and that we, um, we, we cannot be a party to that. Um, so, uh, but, but that is the particular objection I think that we're hearing, right, from people. And um, so I wanted to answer, I mean, this is really complicated, right? We have what, three, seven minutes left, right? Um, we don't have all of the answers for you, but just, so, but we do want you to know that, right, this is some of the, the reactivity that's coming up and then to remind all of us that it's occurring within a context of um, of extremism right there is there is no such thing anymore right right now as neutral ground or middle ground right all of us have been pushed to to the extremes and so again and it's very it's very hard right i am not an extreme person I resent being placed by others in a radical extreme. On the other hand, I think, to, like I woke up this morning thinking, okay, what is the matter with me? Because I was around, right? When this movement started, we were proud to be radical. We were radical. We were proud of it. We were radical feminists, you know, and we were gonna liberate women. And then what we've learned over the years, right, is that that radical edge had a cost attached to it. And we softened it 
And at the same time, we left behind so many, right? Folks of color. Okay. I mean, and so, and, you know, disabled folks, queer folks, you know, sex workers. I mean, we just left behind a ton of people. So, um, so now like that's the gaslighting part, right? Like, okay, what's wrong with being radical? But it's become this thing. Okay. So I reject that. Um, okay. I do want to get to, I think we should get a little bit to what next, just because there were a few things in the chat. And so um, if, if I could, you too, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm over talking here, but the, okay. So I think what, I, what, what we're hoping, right, that the statement guides us to considering is, yes, more prevention work. Okay. So shifting, right, shifting that balance around intervention services and prevention. And with, with this caveat that we, re, that we think of prevention in a very, very visionary um, uh, way, right? That we're not thinking about school curricula, okay? I'm not saying school curricula are bad, but that we're really thinking about what, what do communities need? What do communities need? What do people who live in black communities, marginalized communities, sovereign uh, indigenous communities, what do they need? so that they are uh, most resistant, right, to poverty and violence, and that they're able to help bring solutions when poverty and violence um, are present. Okay, so that kind of prevention work. Um, there are a lot of folks who are thinking about this beyond shelter, right? Where, where do we go with our services? Um, how do we best meet people, really, meet them where they're at and provide what they say they need and support them and what is our role with people who cause harm and how do we believe that they are people too and that they ha have a right and a need to heal um, and to do better and um, and then a lot of folks seem to be interested in transformative justice so those are conversations that we'll be pursuing as an alternative right so we cannot just say, okay, we, uh, we, di we divest and we separate from criminal justice with, without um, looking at other ways for people to have access to and to experience justice. So, uh, so there's a lot brewing, right, in the field. And then I think partnerships with other, for sure, partnerships with other activists, uh, young activists, I saw that come up in the chat. I mean, if I could, I would, I would leave today and turn this over to some of the great young folks who's like, they are leading with vision. And I say, yes, please <laughs> lead us, right? Okay, I'm done, two of you. I can add in just um, briefly, I think with this, but I'm speaking as a white person, I, I think it's also about each of us as I'm talking to the white people on this call right now, doing your own inner work to reconnect to your own humanity, to your own spirit, doing your own anti-racism work. There, just Google it. There's so many amazing resources out there right now. And then also thinking about your organization. I mean, we need to reflect internally in ourselves and in the organizations, the containers we are, the world that Nan has spoken of. And that's where we start. And then we continue to build out the relationships and that any kind of community solutions from historically marginalized communities need to be led by that community. I'm going to say that because I think white people can step into the savior kind of thing so easily. And so it really is about really shifting the way that we work. Karen? In the few minutes we have, the one minute we have left, I would just piggyback on what both Nan and Kelly said um, and say two things. One of them is give your money. Um, you know, once you have conversations and, and you learn what's needed, then just give the money. Just give it. And um, no that everything that, that Kelly just talked about around doing your work is, a, is your own individual pathway to liberation. You will be liberated by doing this work. And I'm, I'm also speaking to the white people on the call. I think, I think that's it. There's Gretchen. Here I am. Thank well, you, Gretchen. Gretchen. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you all so much. This was just a wonderful conversation. Thank you for taking the lead on this and for sharing your thoughts, um, experience, and minds. Uh, for everyone, please know we'll be following up with you via email. Thank you for bearing with um, me in particular and the technical issues and to all our presenters today for their grace and understanding. So um, please know you'll hear more from us, including getting a recording of this with uh, closed captioning. So we appreciate everyone. Thank you, thank you. And we look forward to hearing from all of you again. Thanks, thank everybody. you all. Bye-bye.